Let me invite you to take your Bibles and turn with me to John's Gospel, the Gospel of John, uh, chapter number one. <clears throat> and I want to look at verse 14 uh, for just a little bit. John 1, 14. The Bible says here, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and full of truth. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word. And as we look at it for just a moment, teach us those things that we need to gleam and to learn from this one verse of Scripture, especially during this time of year as we celebrate the birth of our Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if we were to back up just a little bit and look at the very first verse of Scripture, it says, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then it said, the Word was made flesh. You know, as I begin to think about this particular passage of Scripture, it reminds me of what Christmas is really all about. Now, Christianity, and specifically uh, and uniquely Christianity, proclaims that Jesus Christ is the only way to God, to God's heaven. He's the only way. In fact, uh, it claims that Jesus is the only begotten Son of the living God and that no one who comes to God will be accepted of Him lest He come through the Savior's atoning grace, His atoning mercy. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus and uh, as I begin to think about that, Christianity gives to us the claim of the incarnation of God himself in this particular passage of Scripture. So I, that's kind of what I want to title the message in a sense is Jesus, the incarnate word of the living God. God made flesh. Now, how can Christianity claim to be the only belief system that can take one to heaven? There are so many other belief systems in our world today that thinks that there are many doors of, to God's heaven. But the Bible teaches us very plainly that Jesus is the only way to heaven. He's the only door. Jesus himself said, I am the door. And by me, if any man enter in, he shall go out and find pasture. He shall find food for his soul. I am the door. He's the only door. But yet there are those who are claiming uh, that, that they have many different other avenues and there are many different other doors up to God's heaven. But Jesus is the only door. All other religions are based on moral teaching and good works. Listen, we're not saved by our good works. And I want to make that very clear. We're not saved by our good works. In fact, the, the Bible teaches that all of our works, all of our goodness, uh, it's as a filthy rag in the sight of God. As good as we can be. Hey. I hope you heard that. As good as we can be is no more than a filthy rag in the sight of God. But yet there are so many other religious beliefs that base their, their beliefs on the goodness of the person. Listen, it's not about our goodness. 
but it's about what he accomplished for us on the cross of Calvary. Now, I do preach the cross. I believe in the cross. But I also preach the resurrection because the cross would be null and void if he had not resurrected. But thanks be unto God, he resurrected. The true message of Christmas is not about peace, even though we love peace. The true message of Christmas is not about love, even though we serve a God of love and he loved us so much that he sent Jesus Christ to uh, to be our Lord and our Savior. The true message of Christmas is not about joy, even though we want to have a joyous time. But friend, the true message of Christmas uh, is it's all about Jesus. Yes, it it's all about the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and in this opening chapter of this particular gospel, John paints a beautiful picture to us that Jesus is the incarnate word of uh, of the living God. Look at the verse again. It said, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, if you'll notice this, first of all, with me, the Bible says, And the Word. And the Word. Now, the subject of the sentence has been John's subject from the very first verse of, of Scripture. If we look at John chapter number 1, the first three verses of Scripture, the Bible says there that in the beginning was the Word, the Word was God, and the Word was with God. The same was in the beginning with God. And all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Thank God. For the Word. Now throughout all eternity, you and I need to realize that Jesus existed with God. Now I'm going to be very honest with you. I came into existence 60 years ago. Now I know some of you thought I was a little bit older than that. But I'm not. I can't help it my hair turned white early in life. I can't help it. Somebody asked me one time, said, Preacher, said, why in the world did your hair turn white so quick? I said, well, I've been pastoring Baptist people for a long time. And I said, when you pastor Baptist people, I said, your hair will either turn white or, bless God, it'll turn loose. And so, uh, and that's no but not being critical of Baptist people. I'm one of you. I want you to know that. Amen. I've been one all my life. But I want you to know, and hear me when I say this, I come into existence 61 years ago. But the Lord Jesus Christ pre-existed long before 61 years ago because our God, the Lord Jesus Christ, is an eternal God. Now, he was born into this world, as we know. He was uh, laid in a manger, but he did not come into existence then. He was in existence long before then. Long before then did our Lord exist. Now, uh, the prophet Micah declared his going forth from the old, uh, from everlasting to everlasting. The Word was God, it says. Now, God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, and God the Son. Listen, the Bible says in 1 John 5, 7, For there are three that bear a record in heaven. The Father, the Word. Somebody said, why didn't you say Jesus? Jesus is the Word. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. So in the Word, and the Word. The second thing I want you to notice is this verse of Scripture says, And the Word, it says, was made flesh. So the Word became flesh. I don't know why in the world anybody would want to live in a body like this. I really don't. Of course, I'm proud of it, amen. amen. I want to be here just as long as God will leave me here. I think about my blessed old mama, bless her heart. She's been with the Lord a couple of years now, and Mama used to say, you know, 
I'm growing weary and tired, sick in body. I, she said, I'm ready to meet the Lord when he calls. I just don't want to leave on the next load. <laughs> I want to stay here as long as I can, and that's what we all do. We struggle and fight for life, to live our lives just as long as we can on this side of eternity. But listen, when we've been there 10,000 years, uh, listen, we'll just begin to live. I mean, life will just have really begin for us when we've been with the Lord 10,000 years. Now that word became flesh in this particular verse of Scripture comes from a Greek word that basically means uh, the incarnation. He robed himself, he wrapped himself in a body of flesh. Now without the incarnation, listen, we would have no Savior. Did you get that? Without the incarnation, we would have no Savior. You need to know and realize that sin requires death for its payment. God does not die. Did you get that? God does not die. Never has. Never will. God doesn't die. Now I know some of you are probably saying, well now wait a minute preacher. And that's exactly what the devil was saying whenever Jesus died on the cross of Calvary. That's exactly what the devil was saying. The devil was saying, I've got him. He's dead. God is dead. I couldn't do anything with him in the throne room of glory, but bless God, he may have thrown me out, but he dropped into my domain and I've killed him. God is dead. Three days later, he got a rude awakening. A rude awakening. So God doesn't die. Now, the Savior then had to come and robe himself in a human body in order to be able to die. But now listen, the death of the ordinary man will not pay for one sin eternally. So the Savior must not only be a man, the Savior must also be God. Now how in the world could that be possible? How would it be possible for him to be a man but yet be God? So the, th the, th the theory is, if we're going to have a Savior, then we've got to have a God-man. We've got to have a God-man who will be known to us as Savior and Lord. So the question would come to mind then, how can God become a man? How would that be possible? Well, the answer to that question lies in God's mind alone. I can't answer that. I mean, I've got a, a story here that was written by uh, some great men of God that basically paints a picture for me. But while Jesus himself had existed from all of the eternities past, he took upon himself and robed himself in a body of flesh and he came to this earth uh, wrapped in swaddling clothes and he was born in a little place called Bethlehem. And there wasn't no room for him in the inn. So he went to the stable. And in going to the stable, they laid him in a feeding trough. I mean, a feeding trough for animals, a manger. That's the way that our Lord was born. Now, the question is, how can he be God and man? Well, he had a heavenly father that spoke him into the womb of an earthly mother, and he was born as a man with a God nature. The Bible said he was tempted in all ways like we, yet without sin. You and I have been tempted in all ways, yet with sin. So we needed a Savior, amen? The third thing that I want you to see is not only was he robed in flesh, but notice what it says. And the word was made flesh. Listen. The third thing that I want you to see. It says, and dwelt among us. Dwelt among us. Now the word dwelt comes from a Greek word that means he tabernacled. He 
He lived among us. He, he robed himself in a tent or he made an encampment to live here with us. It literally means that Jesus pitched his tent here among mortal human beings. He lived among us. He worked among us. He prayed among us. He suffered among us. And glory to God, he died among us. Because he was like us. Robed himself in flesh. God walked on this earth and was unrecognized by many who claimed that they come into close contact with him. Now listen to me, what a tragedy. What a tragedy it is that men could come into contact with the God who created this world and still fail to recognize him. Now you know sometimes we get a little bit spiritual. I like to get spiritual. I guess maybe I should rephrase what I just said. Sometimes we get more religious than we are spiritual, okay? That would probably be a better way to put it. You see, sometimes in our own religiosity, you know, we, we miss the mark. We miss something. Whenever you're walking in the spirit, you don't miss anything. But when you're living in the flesh, you miss everything. Everything. So Christ robed himself in a body. God himself incarnate, robed himself in a body, came into contact with humanity, and humanity didn't even recognize him at all. Now I'm going to be honest with you. I don't remember things like I once did because my mind has aged with my body. And today while we were eating lunch, several people walked by my table. How you doing, Brother Danny? And I looked at Martin and I said, Honey, who was that? Who was that? <laughs> Uh, and, and I mean, that's just the way it is. You know, I, our minds age with our bodies. Sometimes we can't remember somebody we come into contact with who probably knew us better than, 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 than we ever knew them. And I always look at her and I always say, who was that? <laughs> and uh, a lot of times, She'll remember who it, who it was. And, uh, of course, after she leaned over to me and said, Darling, that was our mailman. I said, Oh, yeah, that's right. Brought, juggled my memory just a little bit. But here's the Lord Jesus Christ mixing and mingling with mankind, and mankind doesn't even recognize him. Listen, this fleshly body that he robed himself in was just a temporary tabernacle. Glory to God. Man, I tell you what, I can get excited right here. This body that you're looking at, though it's growing tired and weary, old and ugly, I want you to know something. This is not my home. I'm just a pilgrim passing through. I've got a new building that God's going to give me before long. Whoo, glory. <laughs> I can get carried away on that little point right there now. I'm telling you something. This is not my home. I've got a new home that God is preparing for me. And Jesus Christ robed himself in a body like mine, went to a cross, died on the cross of Calvary. And let me tell you something. He was resurrected. I like what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Listen to what he said. He said, for this corruptible must put on incorruption. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 53. For this corruptible. I know some of you thought you were perfect. But listen to me. This is corruptible. This is corruptible. It is. You don't believe it's corruptible? God knows exactly 
how to keep you from it, but the devil also knows you better than you know yourself. And he'll parade whatever he can in front of you to get your attention, to corrupt your soul, to corrupt your mind, to cause you to lose sight of Jesus. Paul said it this way. He said this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must disrobe itself and put on immortality. In other words, he's saying we got to take off this old earthly tabernacle and tent and be robed in a heavenly tabernacle and tent and put on immortality so that when this corruptible, my friend, shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then it shall be brought to the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. I got news for you. Death was swallowed up in victory, went up from the grave. He arose with a mighty triumph o'er his foes. He arose, he arose. Thank God he arose. Amen. And he's alive forevermore. And I got news for you. I'm going to arise too. This old corruptible tent one day will put on incorruptible. God had given him this fleshly body to dwell among us uh, for the purpose of dying so that he could be the ultimate sacrifice for our sins. That's what Christmas is all about. It's not about presents under a tree. Even though I like to get presents. <laughs> don't look at me real spiritual like you don't. I understand what they said. A while ago when he said, y'all bring the discipleship training director an expensive present. Hey, we all like presents. I used the present the church gave me not long ago for pastor appreciation. It was good. <laughs> Ooh, it was good. It was good. Hey. We all like presents. But let me tell you something. It's not about presents under a tree. God robed himself in flesh for the purpose of dying. The writer of Hebrews said in Hebrews 10.10, 10, listen to what he said. He said, by the which we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Bless God, he offered himself one time for all that we might be set free. Now notice the fourth part of this verse. The Bible says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And then it says here, And we beheld His glory. We beheld His glory. Now the glory here is talking about the majesty of His incarnation. Now and then His followers were blessed to catch a glimpse of that body was to, that was to come. You remember Jesus took three of the disciples with him to a mount called the Mount of Transfiguration. Who can tell me who he sent with him? Who, who went with him? Anybody remember? Peter, James, and John. That's exactly right. Peter, James, and John. <clears throat> what did you say, Barry? Well, that's all right. That's a good teacher. Hey, he took three of his disciples with him, Peter, James, and John. And they got a glimpse of God's glory because the Bible said that Jesus was transfigured before their very eyes. And all of a sudden, there was two other fellows that appeared there with him. Who can tell me who they were? Moses and Elijah. That's exactly right. Moses and Elijah. He didn't get that one. Vera did. <laughs> Moses and Elijah. Okay. Now, you got three different people there along with the disciples. You got Peter, James, John. Three, you got Jesus, Moses, and Elijah. And Peter got excited like I get every now and then. 
And you know, sometimes when you get excited about something that's going on, you can say the wrong thing at the wrong time because you're so excited. Really, you can. My wife thought I was going to lose my mind yesterday. Whenever we got back to the house and the Georgia Bulldogs was winning that football game, and that old boy took that ball and run 70 yards, I said, And she got scared. She said, are you okay? I said, you see that? She said, see what? I said, that fella just run 70 yards and scored a touchdown. And there wasn't a flag. I said, boy, that's good. That's good. I got to thinking about that thing too. If we could get that excited for Jesus... If we could get that excited for Jesus, there's no telling what we could do. Amen? Amen. Amen. But now let me tell you something. There was Jesus, Moses, and Elijah. And Peter said, Lord, it's good that we've been here. We got to see a glimpse of your glory. And I tell you what we need to do. We need to build three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. Peter missed the whole scope of what the Lord was trying to show him. The Lord wanted Peter to see Moses. There's the law. Elijah, there's the prophets. But I'm Jesus. I'm greater. I'm greater than the law. I'm greater than the prophets. I'm Jesus. There was another time when Jesus walked up to a river one time to be baptized of a fellow that they got a glimpse of glory. Jesus walked up to his cousin, John the Baptist, and said, I have need to be baptized or baptize me. And John said, I need to be baptized by you. Jesus said, suffer it to be so. And he baptized him. And something fell on him. What happened? What, 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 what fell from heaven? The Holy Spirit in the sign of a dove. Like a dove. And there's a voice that appeared. They heard God's voice. And what did God's voice say? This is my son in whom I am well pleased. You see, there were times that God would allow people to get a glimpse of his glory. John mentions here a time when he actually saw the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Peter witnessed the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ in the transfiguration. John witnessed the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ when he was baptized. And I'm here to tell you that we can still witness his glory. We can. We can still witness His glory because His glory is still real. It's still real. I got a good glimpse of it this morning. When David preached, he blessed me. He blessed me. Now the last thing that I want you to see, notice what it says. We beheld His glory. It says, The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and full of truth. That term, the only begotten, is a unique descriptive term. It's a unique descriptive term that John uses to describe who Jesus really is. It means that he is... uh, He wasn't originated by anyone here but he's an original an original the original God himself prior to Jesus there had never been another like him and I want you to know there will never be another like him he is the one and the only son of the living God full of grace, full of truth. Literally, he abounds with grace and truth. 
And I'm going to be very honest with you. Without Jesus, there's no truth in any of you. Did you hear me? Did you hear me? I point one finger at you. There's three pointing back at me. Without Jesus, there's no truth in any of us. And you know, we categorize sin. Oh, it won't hurt preacher just to tell a little white lie. Little white lies, still a lie. It's not the truth. The Bible says here that he was full of grace and full of truth. Plenty of grace. I can still hear my dear old sweet granddaddy Buford. And Daddy Buford, you, you, I, wish I, ever, I wish everybody could have known him. And I wish everybody could have sat under their feet under his table one time. You didn't ever visit Buford Chifflet that you weren't invited to come in and eat. Maggie, set an extra plate, honey. Set an extra plate. I can still see that old big table. Let me tell you something. We had a table that filled up a room. And there was a pile of us that sat around that table. A pile of us. And if anybody drove up, I guess set an extra plate. Because there's always plenty. Plenty. And I can just see that old big, big, I don't know what it was, some big old pan that Granny owned. Just rounded up with brown, good buttermilk battered fried chicken. And them old cat head biscuit. Boy, there's always plenty. Butter beans, peas, all good country cooking. Good country cooking. Let me tell you something. That was living. I like country cooking. I like country cooking. Don't you like country cooking? I mean, have you ever been to a restaurant that invited you to come in and say good city cooking? Huh? I mean, think about that. Most of the signs say good country cooking. And if you see a sign that says good country cooking, usually it means that, boy, there's some good stuff in there. But I ain't never been nowhere and saw a sign that says, we'd be glad to have you to have some of our good city cooking. If you ever see a sign like that, you might want to stay away from that place. You hear me? Now, what are you getting at, preacher? Granny always had plenty. And I want you to know that God has plenty of grace. He has plenty of grace. Enough for every human being that's ever been born on the face of this earth. Jesus has enough grace to save everybody. The sad thing is there's some people who don't ever want to be saved. They want to live their life in their way. On their own terms. Let me ask you a question. How do we embrace? How do we embrace the one and only Son of God, the Lord Jesus? I think John gives us the answer to that. Look at verse 12 of chapter 1. But as many. But. Here's another good but. <laughs> Ooh, I like a good one. You know, you can have good ones and bad ones. I've already told you that. In our society, there's more bad ones than good ones. If you ever had somebody to say to you, or if you ever have somebody to say to you, I love you, but you better look out. But this is a good but. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons and daughters of God, even to them that believe on his name. That make a Baptist shout. Did you hear me? I'm a child of God. And I'm a child of God because God robed himself in a body of flesh died on the cross of Calvary, but glory to God, he didn't stay dead. Three days later, he got up from a grave, 
walked among men for 40 days, ascended back to his Father, sitting at the right hand of God, ever making intercession for you and I, those of us who will accept him as Lord and Savior. Now the question is today, have you by simple faith received him? I look out at this little group of people, and I believe you all have. I really do. We may have some children that as they grow older, they'll make decisions for Christ. But if you hadn't ever received him, it'd be the greatest Christmas gift that you could ever receive. A lot of times, and I've got a message somewhere, and I don't know just where it is now, but I've got a message that I title, What Are You Going to Give Jesus? For Christmas. And I answer that. Jesus don't want but one thing. For Christmas. Don't know what he wants. He wants you. That's all he wants. He wants you. Stand with me. Father thank you so much for your word. And I pray that you will use it now for your glory. For Christ's sake. Amen.